Aloha, buongiorno, buonasera, or buonanotte. Come stai? You can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go live in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German or Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to live in America and become an American. Welcome back to A Nation of Immigrants, a live new talk show program featuring the lives of immigrants, knowledge, diversity, and inclusion. Brought to you by Kingsfield Law Office and Think Tank Hawaii. We invite renowned immigrants to discuss their life stories, immigration adventures, and the contribution to cultural diversity. Today's guest is our good friend, Alan Schley. Alan is an artist, curator, and a social pioneer. Currently the Vice President for International Association for female artist. She has been past president for the Minnesota Women's Caucus for Art, co-founder of the Wave Gallery in Lower Town St. Paul in the early 1980s, and on the board of WARM, W-A-R-M. She has shown her work nationally and internationally, including Border Museum of Contemporary Art, International Design Center in Minneapolis, and had many of her images have been used for such organizations as Partners for Women Equality, Code Pink, St. Anthony Park Neighbors for Peace and Celebrity Yourself, her curatorial debut for the Women and Many Project at the University of Minnesota Catherine Nash Gallery stretch her to a new level. Her work is in multiple private collections throughout the United States, Canada, China, and Africa. Welcome to the show, Alan. We are so happy to have you on the show. I'm honored. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. You know, we know each other for uh, a number of years, and I know you are uh, a, a second generation Italian and or Sicilian. And please tell us about your family and how you, they settled in Minnesota. Um, I came to um, Minnesota over 40 years ago from Boston as a graduate student, student's husband, wife. That was another life. I was a young mom. Uh, originally, I was born in Washington, D.C., where my parents, both first generation Southern Italians, my father Sicilian and my mother from uh, parts of uh, Calabria, uh, met after World War II. Uh, we moved back to my mom's uh, childhood home in Providence, which was intensively settled by Southern Italians in the late uh, 1800s, like 1890s and very culturally immersed. Um, family was the bedrock of the community interaction there. And the home that I lived in was a tenement house built by my great grandfather that housed extended families in one place in different apartments where they depended on one another for food, economic, social, and daily interaction. Italian was spoken in that neighborhood, and there was a parallel universe in that the culture was dominant, but there was also this theme of assimilation in my family, probably in other families around me, which directed them to become more like the predominant white culture. A wasp is what it was called, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, educated, affluent, and successfully uh, successful by certain standards set by the American culture of the 50s. Most of my mother's family had left that community behind. And uh, my mother's brothers and sisters had attended, in, uh, in some cases, Ivy League schools and um, viewed parts of the Italian culture and behavior as contrary to succeeding um, in the American dream. Well, it's a beautiful, uh, uh, you know, American story. Uh, you, your parents, I think that uh, Sicilians make a di pretty uh, uh, distinct distinction between being Sicilian and Italian. So you are, uh, uh, I think you are both Sicilian and Italian and not obviously uh, Minnesotan and American. And uh, have you got a chance to visit Italy? I have not had a chance to visit Italy, but 
ever. Um, circumstances never allowed it, but I'm going this year. My cousin just got back last week from finding a villa in Tuscany. And wow. so I'm going to have the opportunity to visit in the fall. And uh, we're all kind of going to converge and then be able to kind of go out from that villa. I'm very excited and looking forward to that. It's well, going I'm, to be I'm, perfect. I'm excited for you. Italy is just absolutely stunningly beautiful. Uh, you know, I wrote this a few years ago in a parallel universe. I really appreciate you mentioning parallel universe. I, I wrote this uh, uh, in one of my articles. I said in a parallel universe, once upon a time, I was an Italian chef in Firenze, Florence. I mastered Tuscany cuisine. I turned deceptively simple ingredients, flour, cheese, veggie, uh, mushroom, and a fresh fruit into mm -hmm. exquisitely profound art of delicacy completed by a sip of County Tipperary. I have a tremendous affinity for all things Italian, and I firmly believe that I was an Italian in one of my prior lives. So what would your prior life be like if you could imagine it? Um, I, I love it. <laughs> I love what you're talking about. I, I think I must have multiple parallel lives because I live in my imagination as an artist. I imagined myself for a long time a dancer I, as a young girl in, in kindergarten. My teacher gave me a picture of a ballerina and I took ballet for about four or five years uh, and received a, a book about being a ballerina. I then danced um, incessantly to Tchaikovsky's uh, Swan Lake. And when I began to do my own process in art, I did multiple images of dancers with my brush strokes in India ink and devoting myself to a dancer series and doing uh, pieces entitled uh, Pachelbel Canon in, in D major. And uh, I think I did those pieces so I could live as a dancer through them and loving movement and music and the feeling of of it seems to touch on the sacredness of life and the tenderness of human emotion across all boundaries. So I love it. Well, beautiful, beautifully said. Thank you very much. And uh, oh, I believe all Italians are an artist, natural born artist. <laughs> and you are a uh, you know, practicing artist. Could you tell us about your artistic background and uh, what kind of art you do? So, I grew up the daughter of an artist. Um, and so I was immersed in art from a very young age. So by the time I was, um, I would say, could hold something, my father put a pencil in my hand. We spent hours in museums, uh, uh, putting uh, in museums and galleries in Washington, DC, which is where I was born. And on most Sunday afternoons, I drew constantly. And by the time I was in high school and possibly earlier, I was doing portraits of people for money. The um, pertinent issue was that it was paradoxical at the time because um, my father could have been uh, suffering from PSTD and which was unknown back then. And um, he struggled as an artist and died suddenly of a heart attack when I was about 17 right. years old. And so I was told not to do art. And so my mother's family urged me to major in something else. And I went on to school to major in English. And um, my brothers even went to the Rhode Island School of Design for a time, which is one of the best art schools in the country. And they were also discouraged from focusing on art, even though all of us were, were kind of driven by my dad and had it in our blood to do. So I, I um, one of the most pivotal times I, I, when I started and began my own art, because I was doing portraits all the time, was when I came uh, and moved out of my comfort zone of Providence and came to Minnesota. And during that time, I developed my own practice, which was a style um, that I had dabbed with in college, but never pursued, pursued. It was ink and brush. And it was an easy choice to, to overcome because, um, frankly, it was economics. They were the tools I could afford. 
so an ink, a bottle of ink and brush. And I liked, but I began to like the uh, simplicity and feeling of stretching this medium to the maximum of expression. My dad, he always talked about painting more than the eyes could see. And um, there was this quote that I think really influenced me that he said, in art, I believe in art, what is important is, uh, is not said is more important, if not more so, than what is explicit. I apologize for that. A no. detailed portrayal of the subject matter is of less importance to me than the emotional content or inner perception. So that really impacted me. And it's almost like I had to leave Providence in order to get back to the authentic part of myself as an artist and also in understanding my identity as an Italian American, both of which I felt like I had to dismiss in order to survive. Mm. If that makes sense. Well, please elaborate that, that uh, dismiss in order to survive. We are talking about assimilation or the, the inclusion, the question of assimilation inclusion. As a Chinese American, I feel, uh, you know, I don't need to dismiss my uh, Chinese identity because, uh, you know, I, I, I was trained an artist in college as well and uh, you, you'll remember that and uh, later i uh, i went to law school in the united states uh, there are two things there are only two things can bring me close to tears that's chinese literature and american law and i see absolutely no conflict between these two and because that i'm a linear descendant of the chinese arts and literature tradition and at the same time, I'm proudly American and Asian American. So uh, I can understand, you know, uh, why you uh, see that uh, identity is, is vitally important for an artist, an Italian American artist. And uh, uh, please uh, tell us more about uh, uh, your, your feeling and how, how, how do you think about this inclusion and assimilation issue? Well, I think that this is a really poignant issue because I spent mm -hmm. so much time denying myself to be the artist that I really wanted to be, which was the path that my father was. I also, at the same time, was denying my own heritage of being Italian because at the time when, when I was younger and I was growing up, um, we were told not to speak Italian. We didn't learn a dual language. Yeah. Um, uh, they uh, told us to speak English because we were American. And um, so that we really had a lot of pressure not to connect ourselves with our, our ancestry or our roots. I think that was just the culture of the 50s. Mm -hmm. That's changed now, yes. um, which has actually allowed a liberation for, for many of us who have spent so much time denying ourselves of the things that we're very much, we have an affinity for, food, one mm -hmm. thing, um, the things that, we, uh, that make us who we are um, as Italians, as it, it, that just um, the things that we relate to and connect ourselves to, for a long time, it was almost like we, we had to subdue it um, in order to survive. Um, so I kind of recognized that the, um, the liberation of many of the, uh, the cultural liberation that's happening for many uh, immigrants and for uh, Native Americans and for uh, African Americans who have endured much more than I could ever imagine, um, or uh, believe mm -hmm. uh, could happen. Uh, I think it's been a, an unleashing for all of us of things that um, allow us to be more ourselves and, and yes. be more authentic. And um, so I feel almost uh, liberated by it. Absolutely, I agree with every word you just said. It's uh... One of my friends uh, uh, who is a Chinese American and who couldn't speak a word of Chinese because her parents uh, prohibited her to learn 
and speak Chinese at home because they wanted her to be part of the, the uh, assimilation, to be assimilated totally yes. into the American society. Yes. And yeah, so I, I just, um, uh, just by pure serendipity, come to the, came to the, this country when, when I was uh, already adult, I came to this country 28 years old then in, in 2000. And I just been lucky to I come, come to this country at the right time, in the right place, and now in Minnesota. But I really appreciate it. I, I can, you know, imagine, you know, the difficulty and the hardship you have endured and the cultural identity you try to build for yourself. Well, uh, you know, make sure that you are being recognized and, and, and um, uh, valued. So, uh, and you're a practicing artist. I'm always curious about, you know, you know, everybody have a favorite artist, but I'm always more interested in uh, asking a practicing artist, a real artist like you, or who is your favorite artist? Well, I'm, I'm thinking of, of the artists that, um, I have many of them. I, when I stirred first, and because my father was so um, immersed in art, and had many art books. I grew up uh, looking at the books of Da Vinci or the art of Da Vinci and the Renaissance period. So that was part of my kind of enculturation initially into art or introduction into art. Um, but um, I started to begin to search out uh, women artists because I wanted to kind of understand and I had uh, started a collection of Georgia O'Keeffe. And so I got very immersed in Georgia O'Keeffe because she started talking about how when she was in art school, she, um, she, she developed her um, style of art through doing the masters. She kept thinking, how can I improve on the masters? They've already done it. And so mm -hmm. she began to do her own art and then is what spoke to me. So I started to believe in myself and believe that I could develop my own art and that the only way that I could really perfect myself was by being myself and doing my art. And so I did it initially in a closet. I always say I did art in a closet because that's about all the space I had for it. But then I started to begin to do images that people were, and I did it with this ink and brush and people, it started speaking to people and people started wanting to have, have the pieces of which always surprised me, but it was really my, my process. So I started doing these black and white images. And then uh, another pivotal point was when I went to, um, to Boulder and those particular pieces were in the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art um, as in a response to 9-11. Uh, I got there about a week or two before 9-11. Um, and so um, the idea is that these pieces speak to the, uh, one is it takes a village and spirit of community but um, the idea is that um, we are trying to, in this day and age, develop a way of communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the pieces that spoke through me were about community and connection and the power of being able to um, work. To, you know, if you look at the uh, African saying, it takes a village to raise a child. It means that we all kind of work together, which is how I grew up. So I realized that my art was really speaking through me at that particular time. And it was during that time that I then developed the Ancestor series, if you could say that, take the next piece of art, as I added color to the work. And mm -hmm. this is about, uh, and the mountains in Boulder spoke to me, the environment spoke to me. So I started to add some color and this is about bound in grief. And I started to begin to think about my dad. And that was the first time probably in 40 years, it was like, again, the art and the environment was speaking through me through art, um, where I started to begin to do a process that, in, uh, that was speaking uh, from my center. And um, so uh, 
I, I began to, so as far as my, I'm, I'm kind of skipping around talking about artists and my, my own process involved in connection with each other. I've really always focused on artists um, that speak to me and my art and my art process, like Kathy Kolwitz was another artist who worked only in black and white. And then there was Kira Walker in yeah, who yeah. did a show at the Walker mm -hmm. whose work was in paper cutouts, uh, black and white, and who spoke about slavery through that. So I very much connect to artists who work very personally, which connects to whatever is going on in their environment. I would say that's essentially what my process is. Yeah, one, wonderful. It's a, uh, I, I, I was stunned by Kara Walker the first time I saw her work. And for the record, I, uh, I'm a big fan of Kandinsky and uh, Nishikawa. And for the Kandinsky, is uh, for the music, because the first time ever I realized that you can watch uh, an uh, artwork and hear music that I, I hear that when I watch Kandinsky. And for Shigal, obviously, it's for the spirituality. It's, uh, this is absolutely faithful, and, but it's also a little bit humorous in that. Uh, uh, to be honest, I, I, I see music in your artwork as well. I see music and I see spirituality. But uh, instead of uh, Shigal's uh, uh, playful you know, humor, I, I saw a, a, a profound courage. And the subtitle of today's show is uh, Creativity Takes Courage. I really appreciate that you, you take courage to make art and to, to, uh, to make a voice, a certain group's voice heard. And I understand you're the uh, vice president of the International Association for Female Artists, uh, IAFA. And there are other uh, artist organizations, and you're the past president of Women's Caucus for Art. And could you tell us that what distinguish uh, IAFA uh, from other artist organizations? So IAFA is an art, is an international, um, I'm sorry, uh, international organization, the only one in the world that seeks to give artists a platform to be heard and now seen. With, uh, and with the advent of the incredible virtual tools that we are now available that are now available to everyone. And I say that with the recognition that no matter how hard we try, there will always be those that we can't reach. However, we believe and seek to give voice to everyone that we can. Artists of all media, performers, writers, photographers, playwrights, dancers, and so on. We have established several vehicles to do this and that have become pop popular, talking about current issues, that encompass social justice and inequality. Um, the world has been transformed even in the last few years with the pandemic to push us to new realities that we never thought would exist. And so he have been changed in the way, um, uh, in a way uh, by this. And I think that IAFA will be ahead of the curve in this way as we leave the local communities to establish uh, their community connections um, created by their creativity, we are um, bringing this virtual world um, that we are coming to know and trying to raise consciousness and create a voice that unites people everywhere um, mm -hmm. through art and the women artists that bring them that voice. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much. I look forward to, to uh, see more art, uh, art events with IAFA and I look forward to, to, uh, to know more about uh, your work and artist uh, you, you represent and work with. We have a question from the audience that uh, from Tom. Tom said you spoke of re repressing your identification with your Italian American heritage and of a liberation that followed. Is there an event that sparked or precipitated your liberation? That's a very good question. An event, one yeah. event. Is there a the turning point? There's <laughs> that would, not, there are probably multiple, multiple, I think there are multiple turning points. And um, 
one of the things that um, uh, I recognize really has been in Minnesota, I've developed a community of people, of very diverse people um, that has helped me with this process mm -hmm. in recognizing their, their own um, their own voice and in accepting and believing their um, in themselves helped me understand that I had my own unique uh, gifts um, yes. at coming from the place that I came from. So I think it's hard to pick out one one particular event. I could probably spend another half hour, hour telling you about the multiple Mm -hmm. events yes. that I did, I have yeah. experienced. Yeah, I agree. It's, uh, for me, there are multiple events as well, and sometimes they uh, make turns. <laughs> Zigzag is uh, not uh, uh, just a smooth uh, highway ride. And uh, we, we, we have only a minute uh, left, but we normally end up our show with two questions to our distinguished guests. One is, if you were giving sign advice to yourself in your 20s, what would you say? And second question, any particular recommendation, the books, movie, and uh, uh, you, you would like to share with our audience? Sure. Um, this was a hard question about looking back at the 20s because I would like to sit down for about five hours with that person. But I think I would tell myself to be less hard on myself and to have more self-acceptance. and. Um, uh, in Buddhism, I would say one of the four sublime attitudes, loving kindness, compassion, joy, joy, and equanimity. And equanimity is considered the most uh, important. And that is uh, remaining calm in even the most challenging situations of which I know many people and I've watched people um, and that have to do that and mm -hmm. learn from them. So I would say that would be what I would say would be something that I would like to tell my 20 year old self would be more self acceptance and yes. um, less judgment. And I would say as far as books and movies, uh, I know we only have about a second left. Um, I, you know, I have a couple of books that I, uh, um, well, I read Sid Hoffa right away and was totally attracted to, um, to that journey. And um, I'm, two of my favorite uh, books are, or one is a play and one is a book, To Kill a Mockingbird and yes, of course. Um, A Raisin in the Sun, um, which uh, is very, very meaningful. And, um, but I would say that I, I love anything philosoph philosophical Mm -hmm. And have always been attracted to um, to the readings of Thich Nhat Hanh and to um, Rumi's poems and things that uh, enlighten and raise the spirit. That is but, the, the most yeah. important thing to me. Great recommendation, absolutely right. And my recommendation will be simple: everything Italian, Italian food, Italian movie, Italian <laughs> books, <laughs> and go to Italy. You 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 you. <laughs> You will feel that uh, your uh, this, this, this is the you you will feel, I, I think everybody be in Italy you will feel like this is home, and uh, uh, particularly you will feel like home because I felt like home. Well, uh, we run off the time. It's a great honor and pleasure to Thank speak you. with you, Alan. You know, Thank you. Alan, Italian American artist, Thank you. Uh, vice president of International Association for Female Artists. And uh, her recommendation would be raising the song and to kill a monkey bird or anything philosophical. Thank you so much, Ellen. Great pleasure. I look Thank forward you. to see more you. of your art. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Alavidarechi. Ciao. Ciao.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.